thanks for that introduction and thanks for the welcome here. Um, I didn't know whether someone from Sydney would be particularly welcome in Western Australia at this time of the year in front of a match this Saturday. But anyway, uh, perhaps it's best if I get out before that happens. Um, I've been asked to talk about um, some of the opportunities and challenges facing particularly the agricultural industries in the wheat belt. And I think I, if, if you want to check your phone or skip this speech and do something else, I, I think I'd, I'd give the, the single message um, that the dining boom won't be like the mining boom. Um, the mining boom basically relied on us being able to dig it up and ship it out. Um, and the dining boom won't be like that. Just being able to produce, I don't think, will necessarily reap um, the, the same sort of benefits that you might anticipate. So, so if you've got a lot of other things to do and you want to skip out, <laughs> um, that's probably the main message. Um, so let's start with the opportunities. And I think we, we broadly understand those, but it is worth highlighting them just uh, quickly to make sure we understand. So population growth, uh, the red line shows the world going from about 7 billion uh, at the moment to about uh, 9 billion by 2050. Um, I think the bit that is often missed in that is the fact that most of that growth, uh, particularly over the next couple of decades, will in fact occur in Asia and that in fact in places like Europe there's a declining population. So those extra billion, billion and a half people in the next 15 years are actually mainly going to be um, population growth in Asia. So that's quite significant. Um, the second thing is um, not just population growth but dietary change. And just to explain this, um, that's a daily intake of animal protein in calories on, on the um, vertical scale and per capita income on the horizontal scale. And these are all the nations in the UN with the size of the dots uh, reflecting the population within those countries. And, and basically the, the trend in human behaviour is that as you get richer, you get more interested in having some protein in your diet. Um, you go from three meals of rice a day to a dietary intake that's roughly a third protein, two thirds carbohydrate. So that's, um, you know, there's some exceptions to that in places like Japan and Korea where there's a more uh, vegetable based diet, but broadly speaking, that's the pattern that emerges. And that transition from about 5,000 to about 15,000 GDP per capita is where all that change occurs. Um, so that's what we see at the moment and of course what this highlights is that the scale of the populations going through that transition are basically uh, one of the biggest factors contributing to the changing demand patterns in agricultural markets. Um, particularly when you consider that to produce that protein uh, for poultry is two kilos uh, of grain per kilo of poultry, uh, four kilos of grain per kilo of pork and uh, unless Sue Middleton's got better than that. and uh, seven or eight kilos of grain per kilo of beef if you're putting them through a feedlot. So that has a multiplier effect on, on demand for grain, but uh, a different effect in terms of demand as well in that you're talking about predominantly feed grains. So that transition is the big factor really that we need to understand in terms of what's happening in global agricultural markets. And if we look at the pattern over the last uh, 20 or 30 years, so this starts at about 1980, this is the IMF Global Food Price Index. Basically um, the story for most of that um, period from about the mid-70s through to about 2000 was one of a downward trend in global food prices. Um, so that was sort of regarded by economists as, uh, as uh, a law that you couldn't break. And then of course what happened um, post about 2001 was the trend started moving the other way. There's been some bumps along the road since then and certainly the volatility of those prices has probably increased. Um, but certainly the pattern that is there um, is being uh, continued and uh, I'm highlighting that fundamental change I was talking about. And it's, it's interesting to me that the, the pivotal change was about there when China entered the WTO um, it wanted access for its manufacturers to global markets at equal tariffs, but what it had to do as part of the WTO accession was drop its import tariffs on agricultural products, which up until then had been quite high. 
So if you have a look at what happened about then, about 2001, China's agricultural imports uh, began to take off on that trajectory. And that certainly sent shockwaves through agricultural, agricultural markets. Um, it's not that it's necessarily going to increase like that forever, but certainly um, that move by China to become a net food importer um, certainly had a big impact on global markets. And if we look at the projected demand, um, you can certainly see that in percentage terms, um, the demand for meat is certainly projected to grow um, most over that period, fruit and vegetables as well, less so for cereals, um, dairy products also in percentage terms projected to see very large increases in demand over that period of time. So that's certainly um, the significant factor in front of us in terms of what's happening in global agricultural markets. And if we look at um, what we are uh, experiencing ourselves in Australia and have a look at what our major markets are for agricultural exports, there's a pretty clear picture emerges about the importance of China when you see um, China's gone from uh, second ranked and about three billion a year to now getting close to a um, bit over seven billion a year and becoming our dominant market for agricultural exports. So we're certainly in the right place um, uh, and, and in markets that China is obviously demanding product. Um, when we look at our exports, grain and oil seeds, obviously a critical um, uh, industry in the wheat belt, is one of our biggest exports and certainly from WA um, it's very, very export dependent, uh, the grains industry over here. So that's quite positive in terms of positioning. But when we look at where the real change is occurring in that uh, demand, it's occurring in things like meat and dairy. So in other words, remember I talked about the protein story before. So um, the global trends, if you look at what's happening in um, our beef exports to China, off a quite low base, that's the sort of pattern we've seen 10, 11, 12, uh, 2013. I think ABES wasn't game to project um, what the number might look like in 2014 because it just it didn't, doesn't fit the model. Uh, similarly with our lambs, our lambs have actually been, uh, our sheep meats have been going a bit earlier than that but um, the same sort of pattern emerges and of course we've all heard um, the dairy story. So certainly I think protein is a quite important story in all this and um, making sure we understand that uh, the role that China plays is quite significant in all that. But <laughs> and there's always a but in any of these stories. Um, and I think this is where the message is more um, uh, needs to be understood a bit better. Um, if we look at some of the challenges, um, the first thing we come up with is, is access to resources. So um, it's quite often overlooked, but the fact is Australia has put about 100 million hectares of agricultural land into conservation areas over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And in fact, the availability of land now is a bit under 400 million hectares for agriculture. Um, and the um, amount of area cropped each year is just under 25 million hectares. And that's been pretty static over the last um, decades or so. So um, the opportunity would seem to be that um, in terms of extra, extra resources such as land, um, there's not a readily available offering uh, sitting in front of us. I know there's a lot of talk about Northern Australia and the potentials up there, and certainly I think that is very important, but we need to keep that in context. In the terms of 25 million hectares of arable agricultural land that's used for cropping, Ord Stage 2 is about 20,000 hectares. Um, so in percentage terms, uh, it's quite a small number. And so I think we need to keep uh, that in perspective. And of course, if we look at what's happened in, in livestock numbers, um, uh, we've had a bit of a build up in beef cattle, that number will come down this year. Sheep, we've gone down from about 170 million in 91 to now about 70 million. And if we look at the area of crops, as I said, um, the wheat and other crops have pretty much been static over the last decade or so. Um, and similar, the picture emerges with water. Um, this is the Murray-Darling Basin because that's our main irrigation basin. But certainly we're about 25% um, back on the peak utilisation available for irrigation water. So um, both those resources are probably, you'd say, at some sort of limit, and we're not readily going to get access to big areas without a, a fairly substantial cost. So that creates some limitation in terms of uh, what we can do in the future. Um, I think the second point to keep in mind, though, and this is equally important, 
is there's actually competition. Um, so unlike the mining boom where perhaps a country like Australia in terms of its access to uh, cheap resources was, uh, was pretty much top of the pops, when it comes to agriculture uh, we're just one of quite a number of significant players. And if you look at trends in agricultural exports to the big five markets in Asia, so China, India, Indonesia, Japan and Korea, over the last uh, decade, a bit over a decade, the big growth um, has actually been the USA and Brazil. They have been the two growth stories that have really um, uh, grown in terms of the volume or the value of exports, if you like, that they have provided to Asia. So um, we have managed to grow. Um, but in percentage terms, nowhere near as much, and certainly even not even as much as New Zealand has. So, so in terms of um, uh, getting access, or if you like, uh, taking advantage of those opportunities, um, this is unlike the mining boom in that these um, markets are quite competitive, and we certainly know that those that have been involved in agriculture on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the other challenge that has been referred to uh, earlier is that, that competition, that uh, thinness of margins, if you like, for agricultural operations has um, pushed um, farm consolidation. So we're seeing um, a, a fairly constant downward trajectory in the number of farm businesses in Australia as those farmers consolidate. Just to explain this, this is actually the ABS data. Um, Unfortunately, the way the ABS works, they decided to change the way they counted farmers in 2005 and we actually increased by 30,000 farmers that year. Um, so um, what we've done is back uh, forecast, if you like, what the actual number would be based on the trend that's available and ignoring that 30,000 uh, jump in farm numbers in 2005. So that shows you that we went from about uh, 180,000 farm businesses in '94. Uh, to around about um, about 115,000 at the moment, and the trajectory is that we'll be probably under 100,000 by the time we get out to 2020. So that has implications in that we've got um, smaller numbers of, of farmers managing bigger operations, more capital-intensive operations, and that has implications around labour and those sorts of issues as well. And certainly, we see that when we look at um, the pattern of the number of farms compared to. Uh, where the output comes from. So the blue shows you the number of farms in percentage terms and the red shows you where the output comes from. So what we're seeing is around about a bit over 30 per cent of farms that have less than, uh, than $100,000 of output a year, accounting for about 6 per cent of total production and at the other end uh, a bit over 20 per cent of farms accounting for a bit over 70 per cent of production. So what we're actually seeing is a hollowing out in the middle and you're probably seeing that in the wheat belt, certainly, um, that those farms that are mid-sizes either end up going, um, uh, consolidating up to bigger farms or becoming lifestyle farms that uh, pay for their farming habit with a, with a full-time wage during the week. So, um, and, and these numbers aren't decreasing. Everyone says, oh, well, the small farms will disappear. Uh, that's not what's happening. These are the ones that are disappearing, those mid-range farms. So um, that obviously has implications in terms of um, what the future farm population looks like and the capacity of that to, um, to produce, uh, to meet the demand. The other challenge we've got with, with um, the, the limit on resources, we've also seen productivity flatlining in agriculture over the last decade and a half. So um, that's going to be a real challenge and part and parcel of that is uh, undoubtedly that um, investment in R&D in agriculture has certainly flatlined since about the early 80s and, and when we realised that typically um, an investment uh, lag in agricultural R&D is, is about 20 years, it makes sense that we're now starting to see um, a flatline in productivity growth and it's reassuring to hear the Minister earlier talk about uh, the Western Australian Government uh, committing some more funds to that because um, to take advantage of that sort of growth we're seeing internationally um, certainly we're going to have to do something about productivity. The other thing that is fortunate that is happening in Australia is a shift from volume to value. So um, I guess the 60s, 70s and 80s were all about growing um, volume. Uh, we've certainly seen that flatten off in either livestock production or grain production, uh, barring last year, 
um, uh, certainly during the 2000s when the drought was on, but, uh, but what we've actually been managing to do is shift up the value chain. So in other words, um, our, our, our lamb products, our beef products, and some of our grain products have actually been uh, in higher value areas where you can actually get a better margin uh, rather than just bulk average commodities. So that's probably been fortunate and I suspect that points to where the future lies for agriculture in Australia. And, and this I think gives you a pretty graphic example uh, sitting in my local Woolworths meat tray um, in, in the supermarket is um, two trays of lamb cutlets beside each other. Um, these are heart smart lamb cutlets. I don't know what that means. Uh, I do know <laughs> I do understand the difference though. <laughs> From a farmer's perspective, I can get $10 an extra kilo. Um, that certainly makes a difference. But there's a whole range of those sort of areas where we're moving from being bulk commodity suppliers to being suppliers of products that have credence characteristics that are more attractive to consumers. And I think that's going to be one of the challenges how we do that into the future. Because of course, with that, comes the opposite. Not only are consumers prepared to pay a bit more, but they get a bit bloody fussy when, uh, when they get extra money in their pocket. So uh, they suddenly start to say, well, I'm only going to buy food range eggs, or I'm only going to buy uh, lamb that hasn't been mules, or I'm only going to buy grain that's been grown organically, etc. So managing that sort of trade-off between productivity growth, getting value markets, but not being uh, absolutely tied up in knots by um, the sort of constraints that some would have put on the sector I think is going to be the interesting challenge. Um, the other big thing about agriculture that we tend to forget is, is uh, the big R word, which is risk. Um, agriculture is the most volatile sector of the Australian economy in terms of annual revenue. So what this is, is each of the 16 market sectors of the economy um, that are recognised by the ABS um, over the period from 75 to 2013, um, measuring the standard deviation around their, around their longer term average. So in other words, how much they bump up and down each year compared to what their long term trend line is. And what it highlights is that agriculture wins hands down in being the most volatile sector of the economy. So the risk in terms of annual revenue in agriculture and a business in agriculture or a business associated with agriculture is higher than virtually every other, well, absolutely higher than every other sector of the economy. And when you pull apart agriculture, um, guess which one wins? Grains. And that's no great surprise, but of course um, that's quite important in terms of uh, regions like the wheat belt where there is pretty strong reliance on grains. So um, getting on top of that um, risk and finding better ways to manage it, I think is, is going to be important. I know there's been some trials conducted around things like uh, crop insurance, there's some continuing at the moment, but they're certainly going to be um, one of the challenges uh, for agriculture, particularly when it comes to, because I think we forget that um, capital uh, availability often is linked to the sort of ability to manage risk, and that's quite important. Um, we see that right at the moment, for example, when you look at um, all those projections suggest that global demand for grains is going to go up and up and up, but of course what we see at the moment is when we look around the major wheat exporters, virtually all the largest wheat exporters are projected to increase their exports uh, this year, and the stock position of most of the major players, including uh, countries like China, is certainly better this year, much better this year than it has been over recent years. So. Um, uh, People look at this and say, well, hang on, all that rubbish about um, uh, global agricultural demand um, doesn't seem to stack up when you look at those numbers. And, and I guess I'd liken that a bit to um, the match between the Swans and the Dockers on Saturday. We all know the inevitable result will, the Swans will win, but the Dockers may be ahead a couple of times during the game. Um, and we're certainly seeing that um, a current trend in terms of stocks reflected in the price of grain at the moment. I think the final point I want to talk about, the final challenge I want to talk about is, is if we're in a, a, an industry which does rely largely on being able to deliver bulk, uh, and that's the grains industry, then the cost between the farm gate and that market is quite critical. This is some research the Institute uh, did uh, a year or so ago where we looked at the significance of transport costs in getting product from farm gate 
to um, overseas port. Um, and so we're looking at, for example, export wheat from WA to Egypt. 40% of the landed value of that product uh, in, in, uh, in Egypt is in fact the transport cost associated with getting it from the farm gate. So it really highlights that in bulk commodity products, um, export wheat from New South Wales to Japan, etc., cetera, um, that's where the critical issue is. So finding ways um, to get those costs down, to get the logistics better sorted out is obviously quite an important thing. And I also um, like to remind people that we tend to think that our proximity gives us um, a, a head start. Um, when you look at the actual sea freight costs from some of the major uh, competing markets, um, what it, it gives you a bit of a rude shock. So in terms of uh, beef in a container from Melbourne to Shanghai, um, uh, 20 cents a kilo roughly to get it uh, on the sea part of the voyage. When you look around, Santos in Brazil is only 32 cents. Um, west coast of the USA is only 32 cents. Um, uh, San Antonio, Texas, through the Gulf to, um, to Shanghai is only 36 cents. So the margin that proximity gives us isn't very significant at all, and we need to be pretty careful about that. The other thing that always confuses people, of course, is it costs about twice as much to ship a container of beef from there to Shanghai as it does from Melbourne to Shanghai. And that confounds people as well and, and helps us realise what some of the challenges are. So. Just in conclusion, um, plenty of opportunities, no doubt, but the dining boom won't be like the mining boom. The dining boom, to take advantage of it, I think we've got a fair bit of work and some challenges in front of us. Certainly the opportunity is there, but uh, getting it realised will be the challenge and there's a bit of work to do. Thanks.